the Suns and the Mavericks so far throughout this season. Let's just go back. Phoenix loses the finals last year. Don't make a lot of adjustments to the roster. Dallas, last year, loses in the playoffs. And they've made a lot of roster moves since. They trade away Porzingis. They get Dimwitty. They get Bertans during the season. Jalen Brunson has an uptick in his production. Dwight Powell comes back to the lineup. Um, but these two teams are on different sides of the spectrum when it comes to where they are at in their team development. And when I say that, I, I don't I don't mean to say that, you know, Phoenix is the end-all, be-all. You have to be Phoenix to be a championship contender because I think there's very obvious flaws with the Phoenix Suns that, like happened last year against the Milwaukee Bucks in the finals, can get exposed at times. But the Dallas Mavericks, their weakness is the fact that they need everything to go through Luka. And he's done a pretty good job. I mean, you can't say that Luka Doncic has done a poor job of getting this team to where they're at because he's done a really, really good job. But when you look at the first game against the Suns, and every game is different, every every playoff game, you know, Dallas could win tonight by 30 points. And some people will be like, oh, that's not that surprising. But here's the thing. The reason that that's so unlikely at this point is because Phoenix knows now what Dallas is going to do. It's get the ball to Luka. It's going to be a step back three from the top of the paint. It's going to be a drive and kick out. It's going to be it's going to be Luka Doncic basketball for 38 to 42 minutes tonight. It's going to be Luka Doncic with the ball in his hands. <clears throat> and while that does win a lot of games in the regular season for the Dallas Mavericks and while it beats teams in the playoffs like a Utah Jazz team that is really really bad, this is not a team that's equipped to go against somebody like the Phoenix Suns. Just look at it, looking at it from a matchup to matchup perspective, and this is something that uh, DeAndre Ayton needs a lot of credit for in his first 28 playoff games. He's been not only an above average center, he's been an elite player in the playoffs for the first 28 games of his career. 17 points per game, 11 rebounds per game in the playoffs, 67% from the field and 74% from the free throw line, and a number that is not going to get talked about a lot, zero games where he has fouled out in the playoffs out of 28. We talk about guys like Jaron Jackson Jr. or Carl Anthony Towns who just have the dumbest fucking fouls we see ever, ever. <laughs> and it's like, wow, DeAndre Ayton gets a bunch of shit. He doesn't get a contract extension. And all he does is be one of the most reliable players on the Phoenix Suns. That's all he's done. You can't say the same about those other two guys that I just mentioned. The bad thing is, the bad thing for the Dallas Mavericks is that CP3 and Devin Booker didn't have incredible games. CP3 had three assists. I think that's only the eighth time in his career he's had three or less assists in a playoff game. And Devin Booker, still from his hamstring injury, has not had that type of game where you look at it and go, oh, Devin Booker's back. Devin Booker is back. And Dallas just doesn't have guys that you can consistently count on to play alongside Luka Doncic. I think Dwight Powell was on a trajectory to be a really good player in the NBA, especially with the Dallas Mavericks and with Luka Doncic as a lob threat, as a rebounder, as a possibility as a shot blocker. I think... Until he tore his Achilles, Dwight Powell was going to be a really good player. But then he tore his Achilles, and now he's just not the kind of guy that can be going against DeAndre Ayton for 30-plus minutes a game. He's just not. And the thing about Phoenix that is very different from the Utah Jazz that is going to really hurt the Dallas Mavericks is the fact that this team is not like Utah and the fact that they're going to sit back and let these screens just happen for Luka or happen for anybody else. They are going to fucking guard you. It's not going to be Rudy Gobert sitting in the paint. It's not going to be Donovan Mitchell, Mike Conley, just letting anybody go by them. It's not going to be Bojan Bogdanovic letting people go by him. It's not going to be – these guys are going to guard you. Jay Crowder, 
Mikhail Bridges, even CP3 and Devin Booker. DeAndre Aiden, he's going to guard you. Cam Johnson, he's going to guard you. Cam Payne, he's going to guard you. These guys are going to guard you. Utah's not going to guard you. Phoenix is going to guard you. And when you're being guarded the way that Phoenix is guarding you, you have to be able to give the ball up. You have to be able to get the ball out of your star player's hands and have plays be made by guys that you wouldn't expect it from. But the problem is, it's so unexpected by any of these other guys that it's almost a foregone conclusion that you have to just keep the ball in Luka's hands. You're not going to sit here and be like, okay, if I'm Jason Kidd, I'm not going to be like, okay, get the ball in Reggie Bullock's hands. Or get the ball in Dorian Finney-Smith's hands. Or get the ball in even Jalen Brunson or Spencer Dinwiddie's hands. Why would I want the ball in either of those guys' hands? Even though Jalen Brunson proved a lot against Utah, he hasn't proved anything against a good defense like Phoenix in the playoffs. Spencer Dinwiddie is iconically one of the most inconsistent players that we've seen, a la his eight-point performance in a game off the bench where he played 30 minutes against the Phoenix Suns, who had two of their top three players not play great games. I think Spencer Dinwiddie is probably the main X factor for the Dallas Mavericks when you talk about matchups. If he is playing against Cameron Payne, he has to dominate that matchup as the backup point guard. And he did not do that. He came nowhere close to doing that. Now, not all of it is on Spencer Dinwiddie. Not all of it is on anybody else on this team. I think it's just the way this team is constructed. The way that Jason Kidd wants to run the offense through Luka. The way that Dallas does not have a shot blocker. The way, like, all of this is adding up to a perfect... It's a nightmare for Phoenix, or it's a nightmare for Dallas at going against Phoenix, and it's kind of a dream matchup for Phoenix, because they're not going to have to, uh, they're not going to have to worry about team basketball like they had to worry with against the New Orleans Pelicans. New Orleans, between Brandon Ingram, between Valanciunas, between McCollum, between the other guys like Herb Jones, Trey Murphy, Jackson Hayes, and Jose Alvarado. And there's a couple other guys in there as well. That team is probably better suited to beat somebody like Phoenix than Dallas is. And this is a series that I would not be surprised at at this point if it went only four or five games in Phoenix's favor. Because Dallas just doesn't have an option. They don't have a mismatch that they could expose every single possession of the game like Phoenix does against them. And that's going to be something that is going to have to be changed during this offseason if you're the Dallas Mavericks. Something something needs to happen to bring a second guy to Dallas. And I don't mean a second, like, potential all-star or really good. I mean, like, a guy we think about as a foregone conclusion as an all-star before the season even starts. They need that in Dallas. And until they get that, they're going to keep having seasons like this where it's like, you know, people like Stephen A. Smith or people on, you know, NBA media in general are going to say things like, oh, is Dallas wasting Luka Doncic's career? I hate that, but at the same time, it's understood why that's being said because you almost have to look at it like a wasted year for the Dallas Mavericks. All that happened to Luka Doncic this year was he got called fat in the beginning of the year. He missed a few games, more than a few, like 10 to 20 games. And then he led his team to the playoffs and had one of the best records in the NBA. I think, what, they're the four seed, right? Luka did a lot of good things for this team, but it can't be all on him anymore. Because the the book is kind of out on Luka. It's that you're not going to stop him. But if you can keep making him shoot those step-back threes, and every time he drives, if you can make him kick it out to these – hot and cold shooters, very streaky shooters, and very streaky playmakers. I wouldn't even call them streaky. I'd just say below average playmakers. You're going to beat the Mavericks. It might take five or six games, but you're going to beat them. I mean, you're going to beat them in a series. You're going to beat them. And that can't be the narrative anymore going into next season.